podcast and the Strange Catholic Show. This week, we'll have Bob checking out his church again. And if you're watching the YouTube, you get to watch Bob eat. I know, isn't that appealing? <laughs> what Our a discussion. joy. I know, indeed. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> our saint this week is Saint Josephine Bakita. And our main topic this week, we're really letting the Holy Spirit guide us, but I think it's going to be on the reciprocity between faith and sacraments. But we'll see how the conversation flows. So for opening prayer, that's me. So let us begin in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, just fill this conversation. Let this conversation be an extension of your voice, your word among us. We ask that you bless this time, that we continually strive to turn our lives ever closer to Christ, our true pole, and that we continually work to transform and offer up penance for our Lord, for his church, same as St. Paul. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now for a check out this church, St. Michael's in South Carolina. I'm going to forget the town, but Bob's going to tell you all about it. Then it was in Garden City. I think it says Garden City, doesn't it? We call it Merle's Inlet. That's what we call it. That area. Trying to trying to focus now. Get my notes out. Good evening, or good afternoon, or good morning, everyone. No, no matter when you're listening to this podcast, I'm trying to be focused here. As the some Chicago shows on. I don't know if it's Chicago Med, Chicago Fire. Chicago PD or Chicago garbage or whatever that maybe it's a maybe they're all together tonight. I don't know. <clears throat> so. I get down to South Carolina every once in a while and I, you know, it's the mass there. So trying to. Get to as many different churches as possible. And if you're on the YouTube channel, you can see the the sanctuary and all that. So this is a wonderful church, pretty new church in Merle's Inlet, a really nice layout and really had a wonderful 5 p.m. Sunday mass, which is really nice, right? If, if you like those, cause you're like, I can't make it Saturday night. I don't really like to get up early Sunday morning. So is there something, you know, later, you know, we get going and it's like, I can't get there by 11 or 12 and then there might be some there might be some masses in different languages that you're OK to go to. But, you know, you're still looking for something in, in English if that's the language you're speaking. So you look for that later, you know, five, six, seven o'clock mass like the one we have in St. Cloud. What time is that one? Six o'clock at the in the crypt yep. at six o'clock. And it's upstairs now as I think it, they moved it upstairs since COVID. Well, see. I hope they eventually move it back downstairs because there's something kind of cool about that, you know, uh, having it in the basement. Having it in you know the crypt, I mean? yeah. There's yeah, the there is a there. a unique feel that's just like a attending Catholic mass basement. in the crypt. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what we call a basement in the Catholic Church or crypt? And not cathedral? always. I, I would say not always, but <laughs> no. because there's a church. We always have a name there. for something, right? We, we always and, have a yes, name for something. Yes, we do. We absolutely have a name for everything. <laughs> So I had the notes up and <laughs> now I no, I'm not so oh okay because I'm in the wrong no I'm not in the wrong thing. Okay, let me look. All right. If we had sponsors, you know, we could uh we could do a commercial and, and insert then, commercial <laughs> here. Right, we could do that, but uh for anchor. Is this the right one? No, this is the wrong one. Okay. I just had it. End of um, show from anchor. <laughs> Why is this not working now? Okay, right here. We're because gonna pause for right station now. ID. Yeah, we're gonna pause for station ID. We'll be back in okay. ten seconds. <laughs> okay.
And we're back. Welcome back. (laughs) For some reason, I I don't have. Okay, well, I'll just. Oh, is this it? No, that's uh, Ezekiel 9.9. So that must have been back when I was in Ezekiel. Okay, so check out this church. Merle Zitland went there a few weeks ago. Nice little drive from uh, Myrtle Beach. It's really close to the coast. Atlantic Ocean, beautiful. Look at that outside picture if you're on YouTube. That's why you should be subscribing. It's a wonderful, wonderful church. People very nice. The deacon was a retired police officer. He didn't say from where. He worked in like narcotics for years, he said. That's interesting. And uh, kind of had a mohawk and had two earrings. It was, it was a unique uh, experience. And he had a wonderful homily about marriage and importance of marriage. I mean, he just, he did hit it out of the park with his, uh, with his homily. It was really, really spot on. And then like before we did communion, he made some statement and I'm trying to remember what that statement was. And I'm like, Hey, this is kind of like, we don't usually like go, Hey, we're making a statement. You know, we kind of follow the right. Yep. He kind of made some sort of statement remember what it was what it have been and about it was not some catholics kind of, or for people that have no it's some confession. sort of religious statement <clears throat> you know you know what that brings up this thing and i can just bring it up during this piece i went when i went to mass in albany right which we uh, focused on yep last, last episode yeah yep uh I, there were people that stayed in the pews and didn't go up for a communion now, there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Some of it might be COVID. Some of it might be personal choice. I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with not going to confession, right? Yep. So so I was talking to somebody. It's like, hey, you know, I just knew. I was like, you hadn't been to confession. You know, that's why you didn't go. And you're like, yeah, I got it. And I'm like, but couldn't. I said, you can go up there if you want and get blessed. I thought you can't do that unless I can't remember what it was that she said. It was like, Hey, I can only do that. If I was a little kid, I'm like, no, no. I said, there used to be people all the time that would come up there and go, Hey, uh, you know, you know, I've, uh, I've you given that and blessing the was, and I've a unique blessing to adults. Yeah. And the unique yeah, thing the same. I mean, right. I mean, it's just like, God bless you. Right. Yes. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, or just may God be with you. You know, it doesn't right. have to be an exorbitant, you know, prayer over the person as you do it. But another, another, you, uh, you know, quick Catholic fact is that you are only required to receive the Eucharist once a year. Yes. So, you know, I think, a lot of times we become accustomed to receiving every week or more often. And then when that was not available to us, then it was a bit of a shock, especially for U.S. Catholics, because that's something that we've just had for many, many decades. And to have that change, and I know we've talked about this to some extent before, but we only have that requirement of going, sorry, rather receiving Thank you, Bob, for that visual. Receiving the Eucharist once a year, same uh, during the Easter season, if I'm not mistaken, and then going to confession once a year. So it's not like these are these huge, arduous, heavy burdens that are laid upon us as Catholics. They're pretty simple. Now, we still need to go to Mass. So all those people that were still in the pews, they're, they're doing their, their duty to honor the Lord, worship the Lord right? That first commandment that we're given back in Exodus and Deuteronomy. So they're honoring that. They're fulfilling that. They don't have to receive the Eucharist. But I also understand when you haven't been to confession, maybe they haven't been to confession and they recognize now that they need to go for whatever it is that they believe or they feel is something serious that they need to bring to confession. Or it's been a year or more, whatever it might be. It's good that they're not going, that they're not just going up to receive just to follow in the motion. They're stopping and they're waiting. That's a good thing. You know, yes, they could go up to receive the blessing, but I think 
just that they're even just sitting in the pew, I think it's a good thing that they're recognizing, hey, wait a minute. I think I should maybe stop. Go ahead, Bob. Hey, this is all <clears throat> this is all good stuff, and I appreciate that. Let's just go back to I told her she could go up there and get blessed. Okay. There was no like you had to be a little kid. You know. Yep. If we want to do this as part of a main segment which you handle, you can do that. Okay, but Roger that. we're not taking, you know, if you want to do it during uh, Saint Spotlight and take it from Terry, that's fine if Terry wants to give it to you. I may. <clears throat> because it let me, I was just, you know, I appreciate that. Way to stand up for yourself, Bob. Well, you know, somebody's got to, right? Folks, that was just a little bit of, you know, professional friction among the among the group. So but we're back on track and I'm just going to wrap this up so we can get to the next segment. I did find my notes. So thank you, Phil, Phil for filling in during that time. This deacon, he brought his phone. I, th I was like, why are you bringing your phone up there to do the homily? I, did, I thought maybe he had it on his phone, but he didn't. I thought was he thought he was going to get a call or something while he was doing a homily. I don't know. I just found it interesting because he brought it like like physically brought it with and set it down like right next to him. Um, you know, he did. I, like I said, his homily was great. You know, he talked about Cana. I mean, he used a story. He used to joke. Good things, right, that we all talk about to try to relate to people and stuff like that. He talked about the sacrament of marriage and about how family units have been breaking down. I just thought it was really, really on point about how simple divorce was and how how you know him being a deacon in his life and shared that with the congregation um you know so i thought it was well done um and he was he was a little bit long but not too bad um so it was really it was it was a it was a nice church. He he seemed to have a commanding presence. The priest did a good job. The people were very nice. It's a beautiful area. Like I said, a couple minutes from the ocean. So I think, you know, you should check out this church in Merle's Inlet. Thanks, Bob. Definitely check out that church if I happen to be in the area. Yeah, it's only oh. about... 13, 14, 1500 miles from right now. <laughs> <laughs> a, what, what are you saying? It's a little bit of a ways. I'll stop playing that slideshow. And the now. bread is signifying breaking bread today with brothers mm. online. Amen. Amen. Uh, that's a beautiful symbolism. If y'all aren't watching the YouTube on the Strange Catholic Show, you're missing out. Sign All up. Right? Sign up. Get subscribed. Definitely. Bob's hilarious. It's it's definitely worth the subscribe. You could totally watch it on 2X and take in all this great information. Oh, I said that out loud. That was the quiet part. So the main topic, I wanted to talk about this beautiful document, and I kind of teased it a little bit when I was talking with uh, Terry yesterday, and maybe even the day before. There's a document that was released three years ago. It's on the reciprocity between faith and sacraments in the sacramental economy. And when you kind of stumble across that and you look at that title, you're like, what in the world is that? What is that? What is that supposed to mean? And all, you know, to summarize, I've only gone through it a couple times, so I'm not an expert. But to summarize, this document is really pointing us into you know, what is our relationship that we have between the faith and the sacraments? And how do they unite? And how have we in our church today in 2022 and years leading up to it lost that vision that the church has always held in relation between faith and the sacraments? And I think I gave this example to Terry yesterday, and maybe I'm totally alone in this because he did not respond the way I thought he would. But maybe you might have known or maybe you yourself are someone that, you know, wanted or expected 
a child to receive a sacrament because, right? And and when when there's that expectation because you're missing part of this relationship between the faith and the sacraments. And that's what this document that is a whole ton of paragraphs <laughs> um, is really pointing to. Now, I, we will link to this document. It is, it's definitely understandable by anyone that reads it. It is tiered towards someone that has more theological formation, but I highly encourage everyone to go out and read this because I think there's, there's a depth to this, but there's also it, it's also touching on what we see culturally within the church. And I don't know what I included or what I will include in the final episode on things that we talked about, but we talked about some things culturally that we've recognized, we've seen. Um, and so all of this is relating to that. So not picking up on paragraph one or paragraph two, what we're going to focus in on is paragraph three, because I think this is the crux of what is is what kind of was the seed bed for this problem that we have in the church today. And this was so this isn't this was way before my time. This was in 1977, which is a long time before I was even born. Uh, that's sorry. because you're a young pup yeah i can't help myself <laughs> in 19 1977 the international theological theological commission referring to the sacrament of marriage warned of the existence of baptized non-believers and i think this is kind of especially those of us that are in ministry those that are trying to reach souls that have been already brought into the fold through baptism, maybe even through First Communion and their first confession, but maybe they didn't receive anything beyond that, that they're kind of those baptized non-believers, right? Maybe they don't they don't frequent the sacraments. Maybe they come during Christmas and Easter. And I think you could kind of lump those people into this group. And then it's talking about a demand for the sacrament of marriage. And I would say you can. You could also include other sacraments in this. Sacrament of baptism, maybe for a grandchild or a niece or a nephew. I know I've encountered that. Maybe I'm completely alone. And my anecdotal evidence is just that. But I don't feel like I am from people I've talked to. You know, there's that expectation, right? Uh, maybe grandma or grandpa, probably grandma you know, says, well, I need to get these kids baptized. Well, part of the assumption when you have a baptism, and Bob did a lot of this prep as well, so he knows this very well, as does Terry, that when you're preparing people that are saying, I, you know, I want this child to be baptized, part of that guarantee, part of that promise, that covenant that that couple is making, and likewise the godparents, is that they will raise this child in the faith. Not that this is kind of a one and done kind of a sacrament, right? They're going to teach the child the faith and home, right? Because the parents are the primary catechists. We hear that from the Second Vatican Council and previous. They will also bring the child to, to Mass. They'll bring them so that they're available for the other sacraments as well. There, there's a lot to this expectation of a sacrament, right? And, and I think this just touches the tip of the iceberg. And to not get too theological slash philosophically deep in this conversation, I'll just highlight paragraph five. And I think these things will ring true in your ears, but let me know what you think. It says, quote, Secondly, scientific and technical knowledge, which is so prestigious today, tends to impose itself as a single model in all fields of knowledge and for all kinds of objects. Its radical orientation towards certainty of an empirical and naturalistic type 
is opposed not only to metaphysical knowledge, but also to knowledge of a symbolic nature. While scientific knowledge emphasizes the capacity of human reason, it does not exhaust all dimensions of reason or knowledge, nor does it cover all cognitive needs for a full human life. Symbolic thinking with its richness and plasticity in one hand collects and elaborates reflectively the ethical and effective dimensions of experience and on the other touches and transforms the spiritual and cognitive structure of the subject. That was a lot of words. But basically, we're looking at this hyper scientific technical knowledge. That. Is looking only at this. Oh, I can prove it with this. I can prove it with this. I can prove it with this. And a huge part. I mean, what? So in the gospel today, when we're recording is for the feast of the presentation, right? The, the purification of Mary. When Saint Simeon, Simeon in the temple is making a profound. Profound statement in that he'd been waiting for the Messiah and he recognizes when the Messiah is there. You know, he'd been praying, he'd been waiting, he'd been fasting for this very moment. Something that science alone or something definitive could not define, but he knew with his relationship that he had with God that this was the Lord. And the things that he brought to our Blessed Mother, the things that were striking, right? That the parents did not understand, right? Mary and Joseph did not understand. So often, too, in our own world today, we try to boil everything down to something scientific or technological. And we kind of try and hold them up as like the highest regard. But really where our focus should be is on faith. And our relationship between faith and the sacraments. And how through the sacraments, our faith is being fed. And we're being lifted up and fed and given the strength to persevere. Bob, you got something? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think it's tracking in the right direction. I, I think it's hard sometimes, you know, married couples might be easier to have that conversation with and, right. you know, we don't want people to be cafeteria Catholics, right? Yep. I think uh, baptism sometimes is a little bit harder. I think parents have the best intentions, but do you, yeah. do you really want to, <clears throat> you know, the child doesn't really have a say. So do you, you don't want to say no to baptizing a child be, and how important that is. You know, it's not like you're, it's not like you're baptizing a, a doll or something like that. So are you, are you making a reference to something previously? This is some meta in case anyone's listening to the podcast. This is some meta information. You got to go back to the podcast when we mentioned baptizing a doll. I do have the video available. I was asked. We got to have put that video on YouTube, please. <laughs> Noted. I no, will. But think about that metaphorically, right? If I mean, if you don't really you think about a soul and the baptizing a soul right. and all the things that you want to do with it, and you're just doing it because grandma says do it, you might as well right. baptize a doll, right? Exactly. I thought about it that way. I yes. didn't think about it as in regards to those practicing to do baptism and doing it incorrectly. Right. Or people laughing a lot. <laughs> Terry, it's over to you. People people laughing uncontrollably. Yeah. Yeah. No, but yet on the on on the flip side of the coin, in the sacraments, the Holy Spirit is always there. So do we also look at it through the lens of, you know, even though we're doing it to please grandma, the Holy Spirit is still in there working and and churning and really working into the soul of that baptized individual, that married individual. I just, uh, in fact, just recently did a wedding ceremony last June for a couple 
um, and and wonderful young couple. They're going to have a great marriage. But I really got the sense that the wedding ceremony in the church proper was really to appease grandma. And then we had a wedding service at the venue the following day. Um, and it just seemed like that was the more important event out of the two. But that being said, is the Holy Spirit still in there working? Absolutely. And so we can pray that the whole that receiving that sacrament will really dig in and deepen that faith or maybe turn that person back to the church that maybe have not may not have been as faithful of a Catholic or not going at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's my even, thought. even your example of the married couple that, you know, did that the ceremony um, for the sacrament of holy matrimony within the confines of the church, as the church defines, even though they may be appeasing someone, they're already, you know, condescending themselves already to in submission to what the church asks, right? Whether or not they fully realize or understand what it is that they're doing, they're already preparing their soul for some greater openness to the graces that God wants to offer. Where I would I, say, I would agree. Where I would say, alternatively, you know, the grandma, the aunt, whoever that brings this child that just like brings them in quick for baptism and then brings them back to the parents. If no one's going to bring that child up in the faith, no one's going to help instruct these parents. No one's going to make sure that that child comes to be formed in the faith. Maybe they'll find it later. I'm not saying Maybe. the Holy Spirit isn't active right there. Yep. I'm, I'm yep. absolutely. But there also needs to be that encouragement and that yes. inflaming from the parents and the godparents. Godparents are so important, especially in this role where maybe the parents aren't as, they don't know as much about their faith. Hopefully, by a great God moment, they chose some great holy godparents that are just going to help drive. Now, I know that's often not the case. It can happen, but often it's, you're picking out a person that, you know, is familial or relational to mm -hmm. you or your family. So it's not always the case that those are the people that are best to be godparents for your child. Uh, Bob has got a question. Go ahead, Bob. That's also gentle. Let's, let's go over to line box, two for Bob. My box would highlight up when you put your, when you put your hand up like that. That was pretty cool. You know, to be honest, what I've seen, I haven't seen it as much with baptism, I, although I did see it. I've, I've seen it more with marriage where there are couples that church shop a little bit. I don't know if that's a term. That's probably a term we should start using. Are you church shopping yeah. for marriage? You know, or, you know, and I think now it's been accepted that like, hey, we're just going to go. We're just going to go and we're going to do it in the park or here or there or anywhere. And, and I, listen, I'm not, you know, we're talking about why it's important to have it in the church and what the importance of the right is. I'm not, I'm not trying to rip those who, who do those types of things, you know, except to say we're trying to help direct you where we think you need to be because of the right especially if you're catholic i mean you know you may you may have but but each faith has their own right i don't jews don't go hey it's okay to just go down to the jp and get married i mean they don't they're not okay with that in fact they're probably much more restrictive than we are too you know and and muslims are the same way so but um i think it's the part where we see from kids that get their first communion and they're going through religious education my my history and experience has taught me that less than you know now maybe 25 percent or less of those students in your class 
potentially are going to mass on a regular basis. And then, you know, you love those parents that when I taught religious ed to drive by and go, hey, they're going to go to mass. I'll pick you up in an hour. You know, why aren't you going to go to mass? Or if, if it's during, you know, if we're having it during mass time or if it's on a Wednesday night and then says, hey, you got to come to mass with your or you ask the kid, how many masses have you been? You never go to mass. And then it's time for confirmation. And they're like, well, I don't understand why the kid got confirmed and said, thank, you know, thank whatever that I'm done with this. And now I don't have to have to go again. You know, whose job is it to do that? To do the most of that ministering and that educating in the faith? Where is that supposed to happen? And that's what we have to reinforce, I think, a lot, especially the things that you talked about. Bob, you have a lot of background noise. I don't know what that is, but I totally agree with what you're saying. <laughs> totally agree with what you're saying in that if people are just showing up and dropping them off for faith formation and then, you know, they kind of shake a deuce and then they're out to pick them up. But that's their only presence on the church proper, <laughs> you know, a week or a month or whatever it might be. I mean, then they're kind of missing the ball, which is. I mean, all of you, all three of us know, and many of our listeners know that this is all brought up during baptismal prep class, right? <laughs> but I also know because I've been to baptismal prep classes as a parent that wasn't quite Catholic. And a lot of the things that the priest said was like, you know, way over my head, didn't catch a lot of what he said. And it wasn't because he wasn't pastoral. It's just because that that isn't at all where my focus was right now you know fast forward 18 months from when the other child was born and the next one was coming and it was completely different perspective and we i understood far more deeply what baptism meant than i ever did before and part of that was I'll, i would say 100 percent of that was my own conversion <laughs> was not delivery difference from the pastor so, you know, part of it is Christ didn't call us to just be like people that are warming a spot in a pew or sending our kids to religious education or just having our kids baptized. No, he called us to be disciples. And part of our job as those that are in ministry is to be disciple makers. We have to make disciples of everyone that we encounter. Is it a daunting task? Absolutely. Does it seem impossible many times? Yes. But is it impossible? Well, we know that Jesus tells us that nothing is impossible with God. So even though these tasks seem impossible and the numbers look daunting and can weigh us down, we mustn't be discouraged because if we submit ourselves to Christ, offer our lives over to him and his will, then he is going to work through us even amidst all of our failures. The things that he wants for his people. Terry, you got some. I couldn't agree more, Phil. I, I mean, I think God always is in their working we as his people just have to be open to his prompting and if we are open to that prompting the amazing things that will occur in our lives you know you talk talked about a conversion you know between the the two baptisms um you know my conversion kind of shifting off here a little bit um you know I really attribute it to our time together in formation. Um, that was for me uh, a real eye-opening experience being a cradle Catholic, um, learning and continuing to learn some of the great aspects of our faith that were never revealed, or maybe they were, like you said, and they just whoosh, right over the top of your head, you know? So, it's all in God's time, not our time. Amen. That's all I got to say. Bob, do you have anything else or should we move on to our break? No, I think we're good.
uh, trying to decrease the background noise there. Thanks a lot for that uh, wonderful discussion, guys. We're going to take a quick break, everyone. We'll be back right after this. Stay with us. A little Perry Mason, Bob? No, I think it's, uh, I don't know. It's something in Chicago. It always okay. is, I guess, because they have all these shows. So, okay. hey, we're back from the break, and it's time for, <laughs> almost said time for check out this church, which we already did. Time for Saint Spotlight with Saint Josephine. Is it Bakita? Bakita, yes. All right, Cartagena, you yeah. got it, buddy. Go ahead. Thanks, Bob. Saint Josephine Bakita. Her feast day is February the eighth. She is the patron saint of human human trafficking survivors and the country of Sudan. Josephine Bakita was born in 1869 in a small village in the Darfur region of Sudan. She was kidnapped while working in the fields with her family, and subsequently she was sold into slavery. Her captors asked for her name, but she was too terrified to even remember what her name was. So they named her Bakita, which means fortunate or lucky in Arabic. Retrospectively, Bakita was very fortunate, but the first years of her life do not necessarily attest to that fact. She was tortured by her various owners who branded her, beat her, and cut her. In fact, in her biography, she notes one particularly terrifying moment when one of her masters cut her 114 times and then poured salt into her wounds to ensure that the scars remain. I felt I was going to die at any moment, especially when they rubbed me in with the salt, Bakita wrote. She bore her suffering valiantly, though she did not know Christ or the redemptive nature of her suffering. She also had a certain awe for the world and its creator. After being sold a total of five times, Bakita was purchased by Callisto Legani, the Italian council in Cartorum, the capital of Sedan. For the first time since she had been kidnapped, she was treated with care rather than being beaten. She was surrounded by the love and the warmth of normal family life. When the time came for the Italian consul to return to Italy, he brought Bakita with him. Once there, Legane left Bakita with Augusto Michele and his wife. When Michele's daughter Mimina was born, Bakita became her caretaker and her friend. When they went to Sukan to run their large hotel, they left both Mimina and Bakita with the Kenosian sisters at a convent in Venice. It was there that Bakita came to know about God. When the family returned, Bakita asked to remain at the convent with the sisters. She became a Catholic and was given the name Josephine Margaret. She was baptized, confirmed, and received First Holy Communion on the same day from the Cardinal Patriarch of Venice, Giuseppe Sarto, who would later become Pope St. Pius X. Josephine became a novice with the Kenosian Daughters of Charity Religious Order on December the 7th, 1893, and took her final vows on December the 8th, 1896. She was eventually assigned to a con convent in Chio Vicenza. For the next 50 years of her life, she worked as a cook and a doorkeeper at the convent. She also traveled and visited other convents, telling her story to other sisters and preparing them for work in Africa. She was known for her gentle voice and her smile. She was gentle and charismatic 
and was often referred to honorably as Madre Moretta, Black Mother. When she was on duty at the door, she would gently lay her hands on the heads of the children who daily attended the Kenosha schools, and she caressed them. Her amiable voice, which had the inflection and rhythm of the music of her country, was pleasing to the little ones and comforting to the poor and suffering and encouraging to those who knocked at the door of the Institute. When speaking of her enslavement, she often professed that she would thank her kidnappers for if she had not been kidnapped, she might never have come to know Jesus Christ and entered into his church. During World War II, the people of the village regarded her as their protector. And although bombs fell on their village, not one citizen died. Her last years were marked by pain and sickness. She used a wheelchair, but she retained her cheerfulness. And if asked how she was, she would always smile and answer as the master desires. In the extremity of her last hours, her mind was driven back to her youth in slavery, and she cried out, the chains are too tight. Loosen them a little, please. After a while, she came around again. Someone asked her, how are you? Today is Saturday, probably hoping that this would cheer her because Saturday is the day of the week dedicated to Mary, the mother of Jesus, Bakita replied, yes, I am happy, so happy, Our Lady, Our Lady. These were her last audible words. Bakita died at 8.10 p.m. on February the 8th, 1947. The petitions for her canonization began immediately and the process commenced by Pope John the 23rd in 1959, 12 years after her death. On the 1st of December, 1978, Pope John Paul II declared Josephine venerable, the first step towards canonization. On the 17th of May in 1992, she was declared blessed and given February 8th as her feast day. And then on October 1st, 2000, she was canonized at Sa as St. Josephine Bakita. At her canonization ceremony, Pope, well, actually now Saint Pope, John Paul II, said of Josephine, in today's world, countless women continue to be victimized, even in developed modern societies. In Josephine Bakita, we find a shining advocate of genuine emancipation. The history of her life inspires not passive acceptance, but the firm resolve to work effectively to free girls and women from oppression and violence and to return them to their dignity in the full exercise of their rights. St. Josephine Bakita, pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for us. A really cool note on one of the links you sent, Terry, that we'll obviously have in the show notes is that she left what was a lack of freedom to choose something that many would not consider to be freedom, right? She chose instead of freedom to instead bind her life to Christ. And to be obedient to him. Which Amen. many would look as. A, especially today in our world. Many would say. Wait what were you doing? Why, why did you do that? And I think she has a powerful witness. For those that were treated. Horribly unfairly. But even amidst all of her trials. She still was able to see. The light of Christ and to choose Christ instead of turning into the darkness of the world. 
I think she has a great testimony for our world today. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more, Phil. And uh, <coughs> okay, thank ahead, you for sir. allowing me to profile her. Go ahead, Bob. Sure, no problem, Terry. And maybe we'll have you back again next week. <laughs> thanks for thanks for being maybe. a guest Saint Spotlight. That's you know what just thought of that. We'll start having guest Saint Spotlight. Something to think about. No, I like there that idea. Go. Mm -hmm. Your check's still the same, whether you're here or not. That's right. All right. All right, folks. Now we need to hear from you. We want to hear from you. We want you to rate us. Please rate us on whatever podcast platform that you listen to us on, whether it's Apple, which most people do, Stitcher, Spotify, Give us a five. Yeah, give me a high five here on the YouTube channel. Um, OK, that's enough. Phil. Is it so please, please, please rate us a five. And then we want to hear from you. We want you to express yourself to us. We want you to ask us questions. We want you to tell us how bad we are or how good we are. Uh, you can do that on all those podcast platforms. I, I don't care if you're calling us from, you know, or or leaving us a voicemail or giving us some uh, writing us a note from Italy or from Kenosha, Wisconsin, right. or from wherever it is. Yep. You know, let, let's do it. You know, we and also we want your prayer requests because we're here to pray with you, for you, about you. We're, we're for that. We are a community of prayer. So we need those prayer intentions. So you can do that on all those podcast platforms, but there is another place that you can do it as well. StrangeCatholicsPod at gmail.com. You can also leave us a voice message at anchor.fm forward slash strange Catholics. And a new feature on Spotify is we're starting to ask questions related to the podcast. So for this podcast, we'll ask a question about what are your prayer intentions? And we please ask that you offer a response when you listen on Spotify. And also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel so you get to see our wonderful video antics. Folks, you got to hear Bob say it. That's the first time. Well, typically in the script, I do. it's your job. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, it's time for closing prayer. Terry has volunteered. All right, brothers, let's begin in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks for this beautiful day. We thank you for the gift of life, and most importantly, we thank you for the gift of this time together with the brothers, being together and worshiping together through this platform of podcasting. Heavenly Father, there are so many prayer intentions of, for people for places, for the world, uh, but these we lift up today for the protection of life from conception to natural death. For all those who are preparing for marriage, may the Holy Spirit open their hearts to the love, love of God as the center of their married lives. For all cancer patients, through the intercession of St. Peregrine, may God bring them healing, hope, and peace for all world leaders that they advocate for peace for all those suffering from COVID-19 or any other ailment may Jesus the divine physician grant them healing for all those who are pregnant or are trying to become pregnant may God protect those vessels of life and their precious babies for our brothers and sisters in Christ in the countries of Russia and Ukraine May the Holy Spirit bring them protection and peace. And Heavenly Father, we just lift up these prayers and we ask that your will be done. We also pray now, O oh God, who led St. Josephine Bakita from abject slavery to the dignity of being your daughter and a bride for Christ. Grant, we pray, that by her example, we may show constant love for the Lord crucified, remaining steadfast in charity, and prompt to show compassion. 
through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the Amen. name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you folks for joining us this week. Look forward to talking with you next week. And until that time, love you, brothers. Love you, brothers. Love you, brothers.